Hi everybody, it's Kathy, dietitian from Highland Primary Care in Airdrie, and we thought we would just bring to you some of our, this is actually one of our most popular classes, Weight Management Myths and Truths, and I've tried to break it down into small chunks um, so that um, they're manageable and they can fit into your schedule. So this is part one of two uh, Weight Management Myths and Truths. So hope you enjoy. And what we'll uh, talk about today is really briefly the foundations of health. So just really quickly, um, just getting you to think about what your stress level is like, how you're sleeping and your environment. And then we'll go into the three myths and the truths behind them. And in the part two of our videos, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what's working well and what can help. So this is just, a, I really like quotes and um, this is one that kind of sets the stage really well for what we're about to talk about. And it goes like this. And I said to my body softly, I want to be your friend. And it took a long deep breath and replied, I've been waiting my, my whole life for this. So I do find um, in my role as a dietitian, lots of times people have coming in and we're really not being kind to our bodies or ourselves at all. Um, and I really like to reset the expectation um, to start from a place uh, where we're nurturing ourselves. Um, we're great at hating ourselves into change and everybody loves a grueling 30 day challenge, um, but we're not likely to stay with it. We wanna think about you know nurturing or being kind to ourselves um, into that change. So and if we in doing so the wherever we arrive wherever our goal is um we're probably much more likely to stay with it and keep it but if we're kind of hating ourselves into change um that that's not probably not going to be a long lasting change for us so foundations of health really quickly i i just often find we lose the forest for the trees sometimes and people say well i just have to eat better i just have to do better and we're not thinking about all the other things that are going in, on in our lives so just a reminder that um you know if you're not sleeping that can really shift around our hormones it also makes us more impulsive um and it just it, it will set us up for eating habits that are, are working against us. And it, that's not dissimilar to stress level either. So if the stress level is really high, um, then again, there's lots of different hormones that go on in the body. So two uh, with sleep and stress um, are uh, the hunger hormone called ghrelin. You can think gremlins, but it's ghrelin and uh, leptin. And leptin has lots of roles in the body. But one of the things that leptin does is just tell say, hey, that's good, I'm, I'm satiated. So when you've got too much ghrelin and not enough leptin, you've got a lot of overeating happening. And that's just the body's response to stress. And unfortunately, you know, our bodies and brains are amazing. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the part of the brain we use when we get under stress is a very primitive part of the brain. And so um, it doesn't really know what the best way to help us in some of our modern day stresses. So yeah, so, and we will talk just a little bit in part two about nutrition and physical activity as well. But it's just a reminder, take a step back. What's the stress level like? How are you sleeping? Um, is there things around there that you, around those two topics that you can make some small changes in, the, in there to just to be kind to yourself and set yourself up for the best chance of success? And then the other thing just to consider is environment. Um, and I, I don't like how we term this, but they call the environments, our modern environment that we live in obesogenic, uh, an obesogenic environment, because the truth is we're surrounded by food 24 seven and the kinds of foods that are easiest and cheapest to get tend not to be the best of best nutrients for our bodies. They tend to be higher in fat and sugar and that kind of thing and not giving us all the nutrition that we need. Um, and we're bombarded by advertisements and all kinds of things for food, which um, there's lots of research to show that that also makes us more impulsive with food or makes us hungry when we're not really hungry, makes us think we're hungry um, when we're not really. So um, just take a moment, consider your environment. What foods do you surround yourself with? Do you try to make the healthier choice easier? And just one quick example of that is when I come home from the grocery store, I tend to like to chop up all my veggies and put them in trays at eye level in the fridge, not down in the crisper where veggies go to die, but where I can see them. So if I'm coming home and I'm a little bit 
you know, starting to get too hungry and I need a quick snack instead of my hand being in the chip bag in the pantry, I know I have a healthier choice. I can make that choice. I can make whatever choice I want, but I want the healthier choice to be easier, right? Um, so it's not like, well, now I've got to cut up veggies so that I'm definitely not going to make that choice. Um, and also just consider who is the friends and family that we surround ourselves with and, and who will support us in our healthy choices. And obviously we can't, you know, choose every friend and family we have. Um, and we don't want to get rid of all of our friends and families just because they're not 100% um, supportive with our healthy choices. But I would say um, you'd probably have a pretty good idea of who's going to be supportive of you or who's going to, you know, kind of be sabotaging or trip you up. And you just may, and, and I Again, you may not want to change them out of your life, but maybe have a change of your response to them so you're not getting yourself all upset um, and worked up over it. So that was just a really quick overview about sleep, stress, and environment. Um, and I'm going to go into just a little bit on reframing because I think the three myths that I'm about to describe are all about reframing the way we think or looking at things a little differently with a slightly different perspective. So this is the analogy I like to do and often the staff at PCN will make fun of me about how often I, I like to use an analogy, but I think it just works really well about how, how we just need to pull out, look from a different way, the way we're thinking. Um, so Eckhart Tolle uses this analogy when he talks about, you know, watching the sun rise and set. And if we saw the sun rise and set 400 years ago, we could say that's all that's happening is like, we're all sitting still here on earth and that sun is just coming up and going around and around. Um, and, you know, in one way we, we'd be right from, from our little narrow view of what we knew of the world 400 years ago. We're sort of right. Um, we're not technically wrong. Um, you could argue till you're blue in the face. That's what was happening. But now that we can pull out and we can see that actually we're all just spiraling around the universe together, um, that it's actually us that's turning around the sun, totally different. Um, and just a, a different way of looking at things. So if you can, as I'm about to show you the next few slides, if you can keep an open mind, um, just consider that lots of times in human history when we thought we were right um, about the earth being flat, let's say, we found out, oh no, if we can pull out a little bit farther, um, we can see things in a different way. So um, keep an open mind, um, just you know have a gentle curiosity about things we're going to talk about as we go on it, it might be quite different than what you've been hearing and have heard so probably one of the biggest myths perpetuated in nutrition and weight management i would say is that the number on the scale um, would tell us how healthy you are so that's a myth um, it definitely does not um, and when we go back into the literature and the research from you know the 60s the 70s 80s and even like stuff done in the 90s and and more recently um, what we found is they didn't control for people engaging in a set of healthy behaviors so they're not even looking at sleep and stress and those healthy behaviors all they're looking at is active living <clears throat> active living so and they usually use Canada physical activity guidelines as a measure of that so doing 30 minutes of activity a day most days adding up to 150 minutes a week um, and then the healthy eating piece and often in the literature we're just using the number of fruits and vegetable servings as an independent indicator of somebody's eating habits and you could argue um, but uh, but it is actually pretty accurate. So somebody tends to eat more veggies, the overall quality of their diet tends to be a little better. And then absence of tobacco and, mo and moderate or absence of drinking. So no smoking, uh, moderate or absence of drinking, that they're eating healthy and, and living actively. Um, but it's not like they have to hit the gym for two hours or anything like that. It's just sort of more reasonable goals. So if people are engaging in those four healthy behaviors, then the number on the scale makes little difference to their health outcomes. So what we really wanna focus on then is not the number on the scale. We wanna to try to put that indicator aside because we know that you know it can be an indicator of our health, but on its own, it's not very reliable at all unless we ask more questions about those four healthy behaviors. What do you? What are you eating? What are you doing? Do you smoke? Are you drinking? That kind of thing. Those questions are what we need to know to make that number make any um, any bit of sense to us. So if you're engaging in a healthy lifestyle, then then the number on the scale makes 
really little difference to our health outcomes. And with that being said, what we want to focus on is just those healthy behaviors, um, which I think is a really, it fits with a lot of things we say in mental health because we're, we are always trying to control that number. And truth be told, we can't control it. I can control what I put in my mouth and what I do for activity. I can't control what my number does. Um, that's my body's job. So I leave it up to my body. Um, if I know, you know, what I'm putting in my mouth is not uh, up to par and I need to make some little changes or I haven't been moving as much as I should be, then, then I'm going to make some changes with that. So yeah, we do like to support a health at every size and just uncovering the healthiest version of every individual that we see at Highland, uh, if they're willing and that's what they wanna do. Um, but that's where we find our role is, is with people's health um, and not so much the number on the scale. I myself would say in my role as a dietitian, just that I've seen that number sabotage so many people. So people can be making their healthy changes um, and doing all the right things. And two people can do exactly the same good work. And one person will see that number go up on the scale and one person will see that number go down. In my experience, almost all of us sabotage ourselves with that number. So if we see that number go up, even if we're making healthy changes, we say, well, why am I doing all this hard work it's not working um, and then if we see that number go down we tend to say oh reward time time to hit Dairy Queen so um, and truth be told if you do any changes to your healthy behaviors for example like if you eat one more serving of fruit and vegetable every day that will change your health that will make you healthier there's enough research to say it absolutely well if you exercise five or 10 minutes more a day, um, doesn't have to be big. Um, that, will make you that will make you healthier. Obviously that'll make you exercise, but it'll make you healthier. So if we just focus on the healthy behaviors and kind of take um, the scale out of the equation, I think it can help set us up for a good chance of success and long-term success, not just short-term. So I am not going to play this video by Dana Falsetti today, but I will include a link at the end um, so that you can watch it on your own if you like. I just think it's really important because we're given such a narrow definition of what is, what is healthy and what body is healthy. And I think if, if we look a little bit beyond that, um, I try to offer some examples where um, it might not be the traditional body of health, but that people can be healthy at any shape and size and just being the best version of, of themselves. And her video, her whole message is, is I am worthy. Um, and it's beautiful and she's quite amazing. She's an amazing yogi um, and not maybe not the person you think of when you think of, of a person who does yoga. So um, I think she's truly inspiring and quite awesome. And I can't do, I've been doing yoga for 15 years and I can't do half the stuff she does in that video. So way to go, Dana. And, uh, and it's not about um, trying to get you into doing yoga or doing any extreme movements. It's just showing that, um, you know, all bodies have lots of different capabilities and, and not to hold yourself back or not to wait. Um, just based on, you know, I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to go to the pool till I lose weight because I don't want to buy a bathing suit. And obviously we can't go to the pool right now because of COVID, but um, but sometimes we'll get back there and I'd say, just don't wait, just buy the jeans, get the bathing suit. Let's, let's get on with life and, and um, embrace what we have right in front of us. Time is short. Uh, so what's weight neutrality? So I like to use this approach when I talk to people. So it really has nothing to do with a number on the scale. It's just where your body functions its best. Your body will tend to defend that set point. Um, it's relatively stable despite, you know, if you eat a little more, you eat a little less, the body just compensates. Um, this is where our mood is really stable, like we're not dieting and feeling uh, cranky. Um, so it takes care of itself with normalized eating. And if you've never heard that term, normalized eating, uh, if I put it very simply, it's just eating when we're hungry and stopping when we're full. Um, yeah, it's stable and resists change, um, can be maintained without too much trouble, and it comes in all different sizes and shapes, so not, not one specific number. It's where you feel your best, essentially. Okay, so which brings us to myth two. 
diets work. And I think we are onto this one. That is a pretty big myth. Um, and a lot of us have been on several dieting treadmills and have no, and know firsthand that it doesn't work. But unfortunately, instead of realizing the diet doesn't work, what people will say is I did X diet, um, and it worked for me. And then I did Y diet and it worked for me. And I did Z diet and it worked for me, but then I failed it. So we give all the success to that outside um, agency or dieting platform. And then we take all the failure on board. And truth be told, any intervention meant to reach a number on the scale. And I will say as a caveat to that, that even includes things we've done in healthcare. Um, if the, if the intervention was done to reach a number on the scale has been 95 to 98% failure rate. So we do nothing else anywhere with a 95 to 98% failure rate. I definitely wouldn't fly on a plane with a 95 to 98% failure rate. So we do need to stop this line of thinking. So I will tell you about one study, which I think was really well done. And it sort of exemplifies um, you know, newer thinking in the field of, of dieting research. So there was a, um, a group of adolescent girls and the really important part is that they were all a healthy weight to begin with. So normal healthy weight, but they surveyed them and then they found out that um, half of them perceived that they were a healthier weight. So in with humans, it's not perfect science because we can't double blind and randomly assign this these types of groups. But what they did is take those girls who identified themselves as they thinking they were healthier weight, even though they were not, and they matched them with a counterpart in a control group that didn't feel that they, you know that felt their weights were healthy, but they would have similar ages, similar socioeconomic backgrounds, educations, uh, all that kind of stuff that they could control as much as they could for. So they had a matched partner in a peer group um, and then what happened was the girls that perceived that they were heavier weight engaged in some kind of dieting behavior so they may not have said that they were on a diet but they engaged in some kind of dieting behavior they might have skipped breakfast or lunch or did a meal replacement kind of uh, thing um, or maybe they were on a more traditional diet or just cutting back with portions so could the whole gamut of dieting behaviors was represented um, and what they found by the end of the study which is probably not rocket science, and you probably know what I'm going to say, is the girls that perceived they were heavier weight had gained significantly more weight. So it shows that a lot of the issues that we have come from dieting and that dieting cycle. So truth be told, we knew that weight, we know that weight cycling is um, unhealthier. So the up down of the weight is unhealthier than being just being a few pounds overweight. So just something to think about and consider. And our last one, and I don't know if people so much believe this is true or it's just a matter of how busy our lives are and how little time we take to nourish ourselves. Um, but I do see people do this all the time. So the third myth is skipping breakfast or another meal um, that's less calories and I'm trying to cut back anyway, so that will help me lose weight. Um, so yes, big myth. Um, and I'd say it's the most common thing I would see. Um, skipping meals and especially skipping breakfast, um, it, it, it tends so consider that when you don't have carbohydrate on board, um, it's a little like um, tearing down the frame of your house to use this fuel. We, we break down our lean muscle. We break down some fat for sure. And the diet books will focus on that. But we also, we can't make up sugar without using some of our protein, some of our lean muscle mass. So we need to use that as fuel. So I, I liken it to ripping down the frame of my house to burn in the fireplaces to use this fuel. Doesn't make sense um, for our metabolism. So it actually does hurt our metabolism in the long run. Um, the other thing is not eating. Um, I'm thinking oh, because calories in, calories out. This this is a myth that's been perpetuated for a long time, right? If I if I take less calories in than I put out, then I should lose weight. Um, and you know, it seems like it would make sense, except for this whole neurological brain component that we've got going on, and how amazing the human body is at conserving. So we can live 30 to 60 days without food as long as we have water. A month or two. Like that's how good we are at conserving and different people. Um, some people are better at conserving. Some are, are, are not as good. Um, but that's really amazing that the human body can last that long. And it, it, it happens as quick as going 
you know, more than two hours without eating in the morning, the body starts to, you know, put us in a bit of a hibernation mode or going more than four to six hours at any given time in the day, the body starts to put us into that hibernation mode. The brain does not know what weight you are. The brain doesn't know that you want to lose weight. The brain's job is to keep you alive. And it does that well. And it does that within two hours without eating or, or four to six hours in every, in any given time of the day. So this idea that just cutting back, cutting back, cutting back, um, and I've definitely seen situations where people's calories in was much less than what they were putting out and they were still gaining weight. And that's the power of the body to just conserve and hang on when it needs to. So typically to bodies that are under stress. So a typical stress response requires, because our, our stress response, we're thinking we need to fight or fly get away from something so that typically needs calories so again like i'm just coming back to our bodies and brains are amazing but we use a very primitive part of our brain when it comes to stress so that's whatever your stress is whether it's like i didn't sleep good or didn't eat good or i just had a fight with my friend your body your brain is still sort of in that primitive part um, and what it thinks it needs when you're under stress is calories because it thinks you need to either fight somebody or get out um, so it will tend to store calories for when you need them um, it is true as every class I teach somebody will say well I don't when I'm stressed I don't eat and I um, ever there's always an exception but physiologically speaking your body tends to want to hang on to calories when you're under stress so, and just a quick reframing about all or nothing thinking because humans are such all or nothing thinkers. Um, and the, always the example I like to use with this is how we make, um, how we make goals at Christmas time in January. And then, you know, we hit the gym really hard and we don't just, you know, pick something small. It's like, we gotta go four days a week and we have to go for an hour at a time or it's not worth going. Um, and Jim's really busy in a normal year in January. And then by March and April, um, it's falling off and people can't keep it up um, because they picked a goal that was too big. So we really want to get away from our all or nothing thinking. We want to get away from the, you know, the 30 day fix or the 30 day challenge. We want to think about small changes or the tagline I really love is don't change much, change something small. If it's a change where you're like, ah, oh, I can do that, that's a piece of cake, that's a good change for you. Um, and then once that's just like, you know, brushing your teeth, it's so simple, it's such a simple habit that you have, um, then, then you start something new. And that will serve you much better than doing something for 30 days that you're never going to keep up with. Yeah, so consider um, when catch yourself in all or nothing thinking, because I have been you know, working like this and telling people about all, I still catch myself with that all being all in mentality or all or all out is the sad part of what happens there. But we want to be in for the long haul. There's no end to our healthy changes. There's no end till till the end of us. So we keep going. So you don't want to do things that you go on and off of. Yeah, so look inside what feels good. I guess the key message is just forget about those fad diets and think about tuning into yourself. And if I'm making a little plug for um, part two or for mindful eating, um, our bodies have such amazing wisdom to tell us to help us find balance. We come genetically wired with the ability to figure out how much we need to take in. Um, and our bodies have the ability to kind of make adjustments as we go along. So we do have that amazing innate ability, um, but we just don't listen to it. We get too busy with looking at what's external. And I mean, our environments are a big piece of that. Like we can't help how bombarded we are with messages um, and just being surrounded by food all the time. But, um, but tuning into ourselves is a way to help uh, bring some awareness and change there. So yeah, think, think long-term, think small changes you can live with for a lifetime or think don't change much. And think of life as an experiment. And then if you have a mistake or a challenge, it's just a learning opportunity. Um, you know, we don't have to beat ourselves up about something. If you're like, oh, I haven't been eating breakfast, 
I want to try, what if I try this in the morning? Does that, is that better or worse? So there's no goods or bads around it. Um, there's no shoulds and not sh hitting ourselves with the should stick. Um, it's just uh, have a little curiosity about it and see how it works. Is it better or worse? Um, if that, was that a change I like or, or not so much? Didn't work for me. I'm going to try something different. Um, and lastly, um, it's thinking about making food and eating a pleasurable experience and not just another chore of things that we have to do, um, not another, you know, strained relationship in the whole scheme of things. And I think, oh, just a reminder that all the doctors and medical home staff are still in the doctor's offices at this time. You just need to phone some visits are being done different ways, um, but you just need to phone your doctor's office. So if you like what you heard today and you just need to really hash it out individually with somebody, um, probably the best would be the nurse in the medical home. But, um, and, and so if you doctor from Airdrie out to Didsbury, you have a nurse and a social worker in your medical home and they'd be willing to um, take questions and help you sit down and even maybe write a goal, like a SMART goal, if that was something that interested you. So um, yeah, if you have questions, just uh, connect with your medical home team and look for part two of weight management myths and truths. Okay, take care and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.